Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the new world of user experience. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll begin promptly in five minutes at 10 a.m. Central Time, so thanks for hanging out until then. Right now, you should be able to see our first slides on your screen. If you can't, you can feel free to call GoToWebinar Technical Support at 1-866-962-6492, and they should be able to help you out. Uh, until then, hold tight, and we should be getting started in about five minutes. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the new world of user experience. Uh, I'm Matt Zellner, and I'll be your host for today's event. 
Again, I'd like to remind everyone at this point, you should be able to see our slides on the screen. So if you're not and you're having technical difficulties joining our online session, you can dial 1-866-962-6492 to contact GoToWebinar Technical Support. At this time, participants are in a listen-only mode. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience today. However, due to privacy concerns, the attendee list will not be displayed. We'll be holding a Q&A session today at the end of our presentation, but please feel free to ask a question at any time via the GoToWebinar console, and I'll answer, that is, our presenter, Joe Post, will answer as many as he can during our Q&A session at the end, and we'll respond to all the others via email or phone. To ask a question, you can just go to the questions box located in the part of your GoToWebinar console. So just type in a question, click the send button, and we'll again try to address as many of those as we can. And it is a, a pretty detailed session, so questions are very welcome. All right, uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce your host for today. Your host for today is, is Adage Technologies. Uh, Adage Technologies is a multifaceted development firm celebrating our 15th anniversary as a digital innovator this year, so it's very exciting. We have uh, extensive experience building engaging e-commerce solutions for a variety of industries, including the performing arts, associations, healthcare, and manufacturing. This webinar and workshop is part of our bi-monthly webinar series, so be sure to keep an eye out for the next installment. If you enjoy the show today, we'll actually tell you about it at the end. And thanks to all of our returning guests. Today's webinar will be presented by Adage's creative director, Joe Post, and at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Joe so he can introduce himself and begin the presentation. Joe, take it away. Thank you, Matt, for that uh, great introduction. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm really excited to share this webinar with you today. The topic is one that's very close to my heart as it's uh, the thing that I'm probably most passionate about. Um, so that said, um, I'm the Director of Creative Services at Adage Technologies. Um, I'm a digital strategist and user experience designer. I also um, lead the front end web developers and experience designers day to day. Um, in terms of the content we're hoping to cover today, it's split in two parts. The first part is really the story of experience, story, story plus experience as a way to hopefully define a few terms on our way to the part of the seminar that's really about a self-assessment or how am I driving. So I'm hoping in the first part to discuss branding, user experience or UX, consumer experience or CX, and then get into some really more practical suggestions or ideas for things that you might try with your own brand and your own organization. So that said, there are a few portions of the webinar that are really intended to be follow along um, kind of workshop as we go. Um, in those cases, I'll, I'll kind of prompt you to, you know, maybe take a few seconds and uh, really think about what the implications of some of these ideas are for your organization or your brand. To get things started, I'd like to share an anecdote with you about wine. Recent studies have found some quite astonishing things about consumers' perception of taste when it comes to wine. What they've discovered is that if you present a group of people with three glasses of wine and the only information that you provide them is the relative cost, so say the glass on the left is $4, the one in the middle is 8 and the one on the right is 90 users will perceive the taste of the more expensive wine to be more flavorful and better tasting. What's more is studies have actually been able to monitor brain waves. And what's very interesting in the placebo effect is that not only does the wine taste better in terms of what they're communicating to the researchers, but their brain waves actually suggest that they're not lying. I'm interested in things like this in terms of the topics that we're going to discuss going forward because it really talks about the combination of a story and an experience being the difference in perception. So as we go forward, I'd like to talk a little bit about why story and experience are so important. And so here's another kind of example of this phenomenon at work. Beginning with 
the price of a cup of coffee at a gas station. A user or consumer might expect to pay $2 for that cup of coffee. We all kind of accept and, and know that when you buy a cup of coffee at a gas station, we're not getting high quality, it's probably burned, it's probably some of the worst coffee you could buy. That could cost you two bucks. But if you go to your local barista and you go for the more experience-based approach, which is to say a freshly ground cup of coffee that is done in this pour-over style where they literally are pouring the hot water over the grounds in front of you so you can observe and you can smell and, and really get into the experience of the coffee. Something like that might cost you four dollars. But here's a different version of this, this, this pattern, one that's more focused on story. So in a story-based differentiation, you might have a single source coffee beans grown in the mountains of Guatemala, for example, that's been locally roasted by a micro roaster. Something like that might actually cost you six dollars. But here's the, here's the thing that's so important for me and the, and the thing that I'm trying to share with you today, which is there's also this phenomenon of a coffee bean that has been digested by a civet cat. And in the process of digestion, supposedly, the flavor of the coffee bean is enhanced such that at the point where it's roasted and brewed, a cup of that coffee might cost you $90. So in this case, again, like the wine, user's perception of the value when it's combined with an experience and a story is commanding the highest prices. So now to some definitions. What is consumer experience or CX? What I'd like to do in explaining this is describe a few models for understanding CX, UX, and branding because as I interpret them, as I understand them, they're actually very much intertwined. They're very much interrelated. So at its highest level, CX is the, is the blue circle here, and within that circle exists user experience and brand. The best definition, or I'd say probably the simplest and my favorite definition of consumer experience is defined by the brand this way. The brand is the story and the consumer experience is how the story is told. But then what does that mean for a user experience? So on the left we have consumer experience, the blue circle, and the things that you might notice in terms of consumer experience would be advertising, the brand's reputation, the sales process, pricing fairness, product delivery. It's, it's all the things that are out in the world about the brand. On the user experience side, it tends to be more specific. So usually when we're talking about user experience, we're talking about usability, we're talking about interaction design, visual design, information architecture, content strategy, and user research. A good user experience firm would cover all of those things in some fashion and not just the visual design. So moving on now, again, more definitions just for some background. So what is a brand then in this world of consumer experience and, and user experience. Traditionally, brand has been about positioning. It's been about the basic elements of price, product, place, and promotion. And for the marketers in the audience, these, these are pretty familiar terms, and this is what I would describe as the so-called old world. So these are the more common questions, and, and here's a place where if you take a moment, you can answer these questions for yourself in this kind of old world way of thinking, which is to think about who's your target mar market for your brand? So for who is the brand? What are your points of difference? Why should someone buy from you, whether it's a product or a service? What are my reasons to buy? And then the third point, what is my point of parity or what is my frame of reference? We'll get more into points of parity a little bit further, but for now I'd like for you just to kind of conceive of how do you answer these questions for your own brand? As we go forward, in the new world of brand, the brand has become the sum of experiences. So if you recall the circles that are overlapping, brand is actually the connective tissue between a user experience and a consumer experience. I like the following visualization for what a brand is. It's really the heart of the marketing organization it really pumps the lifeblood into design, branding identity, and positioning. 
So in this di diagram, you can see there's, there's many branches to what a brand could be, everything from organizational design to brand identity to customer experience. So in this sense, this diagram helps explain how I think that brand is connected to user experience. So as we go forward, really what I'm trying to communicate is this point here, which is brand has become today in the new world of user experience, the sum of experiences. And what's shifting for us is a few of the things that have been more traditional, like the, the points of parity um, are now changing and what we're emphasizing or we're seeing more interest in from our consumers are these kind of core elements of a brand and the experiences of the brand. So we're hearing a lot more about impressions or what does the brand say about me or the interaction. So does the brand do what it promises to do? Is it, is it faithful and following through on its brand promise? Responsiveness has also become very key and is, is much more common today. Does the brand respond to my needs? And we'll get into this point a little bit more in detail going forward, but responsiveness is one of those things that has really shifted as it's become an on-demand responsiveness is now the new expectation. And resilience is another one that is becoming more and more common, and you're seeing a lot of organizations attempt to take on resilience as a brand attribute. So does the brand care about our future? And I think that future can be our future as a society or as an individual. Going forward, again, brand is the sum of experiences. So if we re recall the diagram with the blue circles that are overlapping, brand and experience design are in many ways indistinguishable as they do heavily overlap. So what is UX then? Well, the definition I've chosen to describe this with that I'm most fond of is a concept called the brand double vortex. This was created by some marketing researchers around 1998. So this is an older concept, but what I find really interesting is that in a lot of ways this was prophetic. Brands that are really powerful and successful today have really embraced this model, and I'll show you a picture of it on the next slide. The brand as a multi-dimensional construct is really about matching the firm's functional and emotional values with performance and psychosocial needs of consumers. The double vortex here on the left is describing the internal brand, so the brand within the organization. And these are, these are things that you might see in a mission statement or a vision statement for an organization. But what's really interesting is the connection with consumer perceptions. So what is crucial today in terms of authenticity is that consumers can very easily see misalignments. If a brand is making certain claims externally that it is not being faithful or authentic to internally, consumers are able to suss that out and it will have a very negative impact on the brand's perception. A great example of this is recently Amazon, which on the consumer end has been, you know, in many ways it's leading edge on consumer experience. They ran into an incident where a journalist wrote a very negative article about their internal culture. And it was really amazing to see the backlash and to see this in social media and other outlets, to see how that misalignment of Amazon's internal work culture not meshing with their external kind of user-driven, consumer-driven brand, to see that clash was really incredible. Going forward, gold brand, good brands will match the internal brand with the external brand. And as I've said, this is the heart of authenticity. But great brands will also tell a compelling story. And they'll tell it authentically. So a great brand will really be able to describe to you a narrative that you can believe in. That is a crucial change, and that's, a, that's the shift that we're seeing. So where does UX fit? Well, what I want to show you next is a, another sort of visualization of what user experience design can be. It's an iceberg. So I believe that user experience, in order for it to be good, needs to incorporate some of every level of this iceberg. 
many people perceive user experience as being primarily about the user interface or UI. In this diagram, it would be the visual design. But in order for it to be a really strong user experience, it needs to, it must include some level of interaction design, information architecture, and conceptual design. That's what makes for a great product and a great user experience. So how do we connect the brand with user experience? Or ask this way, how should we understand the role of user experience? I have another diagram. User experience organizations, I think, understand user experience as a aspect of the organization's culture. But what's interesting is that at the bottom level, visual consistency and simplification, information architecture, layout, fonts, colors, and styles, these are all aspects of what you might think of creative expression of the brand or stated otherwise branding. But as we go up in the pyramid, we are now talking about things like behavior optimization and unified experience strategy. And at the very top, we're talking about user experience as having an effect on internal culture. What's very interesting to me then is the overlap between this diagram and this double vortex concept. So what you'll see is that the previous, this pyramid is basically flipped and it is what's on the left. So service, function, functional capability, risk reduction, those might be differentiators, but corporate culture is where it begins to overlap. So if you have a user experience culture, you might replace the diagram on the, on the left, that inverted pyramid with the previous this user experience culture idea. Again, this is crucial for brands and organizations to understand that the internal messaging needs to match the external messaging in order for users or consumers to interpret your brand as being authentic. Going forward, I think Zappos really does a phenomenal job of capturing some of these contacts concepts in a, in a sort of straightforward and easy way to understand, they're actually very upfront about their internal workings to the point where their CEO has written a number of books and has allowed other authors to come in and, and do, you know, sort of journalism about their process and their culture. What's really interesting to me is that Zappos is really promoting a consumer-driven, user-focused approach to their corporate messaging and brand. You may not know it by looking at the user interface of the website, but once you get past a certain stage in the Zappos experience, it's very quick that you'll start to encounter the things that make them different. Their real focus on the consumer, their really high, high desire to interact with you and to do so in a way that's real and authentic, if you've ever called Zappos, I think what you'll find is that they don't answer the phone the same way every time. They allow their customer support staff to interact with you in a casual, kind of more human and approachable way. <coughs> Excuse me. But what's more than that is that their internal workings do match their external. So in that sense, they have really embodied this concept of the double vortex. Their book, I, I would recommend it to you. It's very interesting. The basic premise is that happy employees will lead to happy customers. And what they argue is that it's almost impossible for a support person to give great customer support if they themselves are not happy with their job. And they have taken that to some extremes that, are very interesting and also I would say somewhat controversial in the sense of you know sort of more management theory side of things. They've actually fired all managers and have gone for a completely flat hierarchy which they've dubbed a holacracy. This wasn't without its own costs of course they had quite a lot of turnover as people who are fond of managers or were managers had a hard time understanding what that would mean for their careers and left. But regardless of that, they've really done a great job of matching their internal brand with their external brand. To the point where the recent Amazon snafu where they had the bad press about their corporate culture, Zappos is owned by Amazon at this point. 
they felt the need to distance themselves from their holding company as a way to say, hey, our corporate culture is not actually like Amazon's. So a couple other indications or indicators of, of a good consumer experience. And these are things that I think you'll find on, on Zappos. So I think you could refer back to that as an example. Easy customer feedback. It's also not just feedback, but feedback to feedback or feedback loops. I have a great story of this uh, from a recent encounter with, with Amazon where I had to make a customer support you know, inquiry. And it was, a, it was a pleasant exchange. There was nothing remarkable about that on its own, it was very easy to do. But what's interesting to me is after the interaction, Amazon sent me a survey asking me how I felt about my support request. That is what I would describe as a feedback loop, where I've given them feedback, we've had an exchange, and then they've asked for even more feedback from me. <coughs> Excuse me. Combining channels in the right context, I think, is also really interesting. And this is one, I think, that, that many organizations are still kind of trying to figure out where to go and where to be and how to be in those places. That bullet point is really about understanding when it's appropriate to be on Twitter and what that presence might look like or what it might mean to be on LinkedIn and not Facebook. And then, of course, the right combinations are also important. So you might have a different presence in one channel or the other. At this point, I'd like to switch to the second half of the webinar. And really, what I'm hoping is that in this first half, we've talked a little bit about consumer experience, user experience, and brand as a little bit of background for some of the things that we'll talk about going forward. And many of these are the more active parts of the webinar, where you can actually take a second and, and think about the implications for your own organization. So part two, what this means for you. A little more background, I think, is necessary in terms of you kind of thinking about your own brand. So I'd like to introduce you to one more concept, which is called the brand universe in the new world. Starting with taking a second to identify what channels are you active in. And in this case, I'm really referring to channels like outdoor, you know, a billboard, for example, or TV, or a website, or print, or email, or various social media, those might be your channels. So just take a second and think about where are you active today? I would describe this in this diagram as a sort of universe that revolves around your brand. So all these different nodes, of course, they'd be different for every organization, and, and probably some of them would be bigger and some will be smaller. But the premise is that your different channels are in orbit around your brand and that your brand is pushing messaging out to these various channels or these various planets in your universe. <coughs> Think about Coca-Cola, though. It's a classic old world brand. I mean, it's evolving now, but historically they've been a very classic old world approach to brand and marketing. They were able to dominate the world by sheer throughput. They essentially carpet bomb their message across the globe to the point where you can go to the farthest reaches of Africa and still find a Coca-Cola branded kiosk. But here's the thing that's changed. In the old world, brands were able to essentially shout at consumers and just by sheer force of will and volume of message dominate the landscape. But in the new world, the thing that's changed is the consumer can now talk back. So where formerly it was a one-way, single-direction, brand-pushing message into the world, today in the always-on, always-on-demand world, consumers are able to talk back to the brand. And so I, I hope you've noticed that I've been somewhat intentional about using consumer to define our customers or our users. And the reason is quite simple. There are no passive users at this point. Everyone is actively consuming and in dialogue with the brand. This leads us to some very common and interesting pitfalls as a result of this shift that's happened. So starting with some common pitfalls, 
I think we can get a better idea of what to do here by recognizing how consumers' expectations have shifted. And this is what I'm using essentially to describe this new world, is the expectations have shifted, beginning with consumers now expect great user experience. Users talk back, and not only do they talk back, they talk back all the time. So you might, you know, in the past it was acceptable to have a sort of 9 to 5 support. Today, a user or consumer might interact with you on Twitter at any time. Consumers are also active participants in the brand story. And this is one of the bullet points from previously where consumers are really interested in how does the brand help me tell my story. And the last point is that the customer now knows as much, if not more, than the brand. And I have some examples of each of these. So just to get started with, the apps we love have changed the playing field. Consumers expect great design, and one of the ways that we can see this today is that the most used smartphone apps of 2015 are all products of Google, Amazon, or Facebook, and I could add Apple into the mix as well. Great user experiences have become part of daily life. Here's a chart from Time Magazine which was published just a few weeks ago, which clearly indicates the top 10 are either products of Facebook, Google, YouTube is a Google product, <coughs> Instagram is a Facebook product, and Apple. So you'll see the top 10 is dominated by these giant billion dollar corporations who are investing immense amounts of money into having the best user interfaces and user experiences across their experience space. What's interesting for us though is that because our users are using these apps in their spare time, that expectation is now translating to other organizations of all different scales. And it's becoming increasingly important now to match those experiences in our own websites and applications. To go on to the next point, this point about the always on. Again, if we refer back to the diagram where brands were able to push out messages, it was a one-way street. But today, like the film Avatar, which I, um, is a little older movie now, but I think still captures the, the thought that I'm hoping to communicate, which is in the, in the story of the film, the protagonist, Jake, goes to this world where he can connect virtually to a avatar body which puts him into this other world where he can he can do all the things the alien race can do the point though is that we are tethered to a digital world and we are able to get real-time feedback I just have a illustration here of of the moment where Jake's avatar body is turned on so like in avatars consumers are connected to a digital world that is immersive Recall the first time Jake, the protagonist, finds himself connected to this world. We are all Jake, all the time. One of the implications of being always connected is information parity. <clears throat> information parity, again, is the description, or this more technical term for consumers having on-demand access to information. They may know as much, if not more, than the seller about a given product or service. And I have a great example that I think communicates this very clearly, which is this True Car website, which if you haven't visited this site and you're in the market for a new car or even a new-to-you car, I would definitely recommend. This site provides data for car buying, including once scarce information like factory pricing, sticker pricing, how much others in your area paid for similar cars, what the average resale value is over time for every make and model. It's really an incredible collection of data that is empowering car buyers to make very informed, again, on-demand decisions about their car purchase. 
they can walk onto a lot, take a look at a SUV, and know that they're getting the best deal available to them based on actual data from their area. This is another screenshot of the website where their brand, I think, is also worth mentioning here as they are very good at communicating the brand promise. So information is power. With TrueCar, you don't have to be an expert to be an expert. This is information parity. On the next slide, we have points of parity. Now, what's interesting about this concept of parity is that for many brands, points of parity are those elements that are considered mandatory for a brand to be considered a legitimate competitor in a specific category. It is what makes consumers consider your brand along with your competitors. So before you work on identifying your competitive advantage, you want to make sure that you identify what it takes to be a player in your category and have all those points covered. A great example of this is banking. For most people, for a bank to be a suitable competitor, to even be considered as an option, you need to have ATM service. For banks, ATMs are a point of parity. But, and here's the, here's the big but, it's a trap. What we want to avoid here is the meaningless slogan trap. Too many brands, and your brand might be included in this, are still claiming points of parity for core messaging. That's something that we do want to avoid. And you might take a second now and think about what are the core claims your brand is making? Are they points of parity or points of difference? Here are a couple examples. Many brands are claiming quality or that customer service is number one. But the trap here in claiming a point of parity is that it's not a point of difference. Everyone in your field may be able to claim quality or customer service is number one. Here are a few other examples. Our employees make the difference. Quality is our job number one. We deliver great customer service. <clears throat> You're probably not alone if one of these meaningless slogans are what you've chosen to go with. <clears throat> I can take this one step further for your own self-evaluation. If you're claiming we deliver great customer service, here's a simple test. Call your customer service line with a common question. I've actually done this in, in uh, client meetings where a point of parity has been claimed as a differentiator. And what I've found actually, I've, I've done this several times, is that most of the time, it's not a claim that they're actually even delivering on. So this trap, I think, can compound itself with inauthenticity. Go ahead and call your customer service line with a common question and see how that goes and pay very careful attention to the response time and the interaction. For advanced users, contact your customer service on Twitter and see what happens. Moving on to another common pitfall, or say, here's another simple test that you can do for your own website. Can you pass the six second test? And the test is really quite simple. In six seconds or less, can visitors to your site find out what's in it for them? And if you're following along, I think you can you can do this test in the in the background, but Here's a great example from Airbnb that I think passes this test very well. And their slogan is very simple. It's, welcome home, rent unique places to stay from local hosts in 190 plus countries. Airbnb nails the six second test. This next common pitfall I think is, is one that I'm very fond of, of asking in workshops in the sense that 
it's very easy to imagine, I think, and kind of empathize with, when was the last time you went on a date? And the idea here is that our brand needs to avoid being a bad first date. If in your first date you're fixated or overly emphasizing yourself, if it's all about me, 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 your date, the consumer, will leave disappointed and they will never call you. So I have an illustration of, of such an incident here. The real background on this, though, and the best way to avoid this bad first date is to really focus on what's in it for your consumer. Just like the Airbnb example, tell me what I get for being here. Tell me why I should stay here. Another way to think about this is storytelling. Quality storytelling means increased customer engagement, higher conversion rates, and more people sharing their experience with others. People, us, are very keen on a few elements of storytelling that I think are not overly difficult to work into your own brand. One of the key points is that when we read books, when we watch movies, when we consume stories, we're identifying with the star. Whether the star be the protagonist or the antagonist, we easily identify with them. We want to be the star in our story. And that, to me, is, the, is one of these key moments for a brand. And the difference between an average brand and a great brand is how well do you make me the star? So here's another self-evaluation checklist. And this is a really simple thing, but again, we see this across across many, many websites and, and many clients as well are also guilty of this. So here's a little self-evaluation, a little gut check. Do you have social media links in your header navigation? And as silly as this is, there are many a marketer who are asking for this motivated by an internal desire perhaps to promote their investment in social media. But my point here is that consumers don't come to your website to share your homepage on social media. Social media links have largely gone the way of QR codes in the sense that they are pretty much passe, especially in the header. Social can be done well, but header links are not the way. Again, the real question here is start by asking or being empathetic to your consumer. From their point of view, what's in it for me? So in the case of the social media links in the header navigation, ask yourself as a consumer, why would I want that? Why would I go there? What value does it bring to me? Can I be the star in your social media campaign? Be empathetic to your users. Start by asking this question from the consumer's point of view. Now the next example I have, I think is, is more of a negative example, but I think it helps make the point about consumer experience. I did a little light Googling in looking for some of the image assets for this webinar. And one of the things that I was looking for was some branded campaigns from Comcast. And what I Googled was Comcast GIF, or GIF, depending on where you're from. What I found was a, I'd say, delightful animation of a teddy bear with the caption, before getting on the phone with Comcast. Before getting on the phone with Comcast, just let me put on my angry eyes. And the story here really, again, is about the disconnect between the branded messaging that Comcast promotes that are, I would say, very strong. Their branding is actually really well done. They're top-notch in terms of the message. But the disconnect and the inauthenticity is the reality of the day-to-day -day consumer experience. So they make amazing claims and they tell compelling stories but there's a disconnect with the actual experience of working with Comcast. Here's an anecdote. 
the next web, which is a technology kind of blogging magazine, wrote an article about a Comcast customer that had created his own little mini program that would send an automatic tweet whenever his Comcast connection dropped well below the advertised and also the rate he was paying for in terms of bandwidth. So whenever his connection got slow, it would send an automatic tweet to Comcast, essentially complaining about his slow connection. The next web wrote an article about this, and what was really interesting is they did what they always do, which is they tweeted their story at Comcast, and the response they got was an automatic response from a Twitter robot, which I have in the image here. It came from Comcast Cares, and it was tweeted back at the next web, and it was an automatic, not personal message saying, I can definitely assist you with your internet connection issues. Please direct message me your account or phone number. And what this demonstrates for me is the disconnect between the consumer experience of asking Comcast a question and engaging with the brand in social media and the actual response that they were looking for. The next web actually wasn't looking for customer care. They were only sharing their story on Twitter. And their response, I think, the response from the, the next web, that is, really embodies for me a brand that is getting it. Their response, step one, read our tweet you just ought to reply to. Step two, bring head to meet desk, hit repeatedly. <coughs> Excuse me. This next example from Virgin America, I think, is a great example of a positive or good user experience that has been combined with a strong consumer experience and a strong brand. So on the user experience end, the website is very friendly, the brand is colorful, it's not over the top, it's still simple for me to find and navigate around the site. And they've done a couple of things that have really improved the user experience. And they might be subtle, but I think they're very important to point out. So first of all, when I come to the site, they're not bombing me with marketing messaging. They know and understand that most users to their homepage are looking for tickets. So the top of the homepage is dedicated to getting me into that sales funnel. But what's more is they also understand using technology that I'm in Chicago and I'm most likely a single adult. And they've pre-populated the wizard with that basic information. That's personalization. And that I think is one of the more recent developments in user experience that's becoming increasingly more common and is headed very quickly to becoming a point of parity. The creative, as I mentioned, is also very nice and friendly and it's very clean and nice and it matches their brand as a whole. So one of the things I think that's really important is a connection between the branding in general and the consumer experience. So here's an example of the brand promise matching the consumer experience. If you've ever flown through LAX in Los Angeles and you have the opportunity to fly on Virgin, I would definitely suggest taking a, taking a tour through the air terminal. And it's really amazing what they were able to achieve there. They've taken an entire section of LAX and branded it the Virgin brand, including colors, paint, even the floor tiles are different in the Virgin America terminal. That is a really crucial point, I think, for many organizations to understand the connection between the branding and creative expression in materials like a website or a brochure and connecting that in the real world to the rest of the experience. So if you're a theater, for example, you might make sure that your website is top notch, but you also want to make that connection to your actual venue and make sure that that also is consistent with the brand promise that you're making in your other channels. I think Virgin also takes it to another level well beyond where other organizations are able to go. 
and have really focused on making their customer journey a consistent and unified experience, including the interior of their airplanes. And this is a step that other organizations that, that do some of these things, like Southwest Airlines, for example, does some things that are in line with this way of thinking, but they are not able to get quite this far. And there's different reasons for that in their case, and they have to do with their pricing strategy. But here, I think what's amazing is even the color on the interior of a Virgin America plane is different. They've tried to create what for many people is an uncomfortable, arduous event into an experience, and they're trying to make that positive with everything from the lighting to the soundtrack they play when you get onto the plane to the screen and their branded interactive console that's on the back of every chair. Lots of little decisions building up to supporting a unified experience. And here's the thing. Consumers get it. Consumers will make loyalty choices based on the combination of both story and experience. And it's crucial to be authentic. <clears throat> the brand promise must match the consumer experience. As we're approaching the end here of my presentation, I have just one more slide to share with you, which is this final summary and self-assessment. How is my driving? And here are a couple of the questions that we've gone through. So in summary, am I telling a story? Are my consumers the protagonist? Do I provide both an experience and a story? Is my voice authentic? So with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining me in this webinar. It's, it's been a real pleasure to share some of these ideas with you all as there are things that I'm very passionate about. And I can hand it back to you, Matt. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. So now I'd like to just uh, announce that we have entered officially the Q&A portion of today's event. We do have a few minutes to answer questions, so if you haven't done so already, please use the question box as part of the GoToWebinar console to enter your questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can now, probably not too many, and then all the rest we'll respond to via email or phone. Uh, so, Joe, we did receive a few questions during the webinar, and so uh, we'll just go through them just in about the order they came in. So why don't we start with, and I'll add a little bit of context to these, what's the absolute first thing I need to do to develop my digital brand? I know we talked uh, pretty in pretty much uh, a lot of detail about this. What's the very first thing? Yeah, that question is an interesting one because it will depend, of course, on where your brand is already in identifying some of these key points. But in general, I like to recommend taking an approach that's an inquisitive approach and asking yourself some very pointed questions. And, and there, there's at least a couple techniques for this. Uh, one that I like is this five whys approach where you can ask yourself, what is your core message? And then ask yourself, why is that important? And then in response to your next answer, say, well, why is that important? And typically, using this technique, you can get to the real core of why it is that you do what you do. And I think understanding that is probably the most crucial point in developing an authentic brand voice. And again, this has to do with that double vortex idea where your internal workings need to match your external messaging in order to be authentic. And in order to create that internal voice, you really need to understand the why. Great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, we also, we had a couple questions about some of the sources or resources you'd recommend as a next step to go along with the material, you, material you've discussed. Are there any resources you'd recommend? Yeah, sure. There are resources for each of the different elements of the brand that we've kind of broken down. And I think I'd have specific recommendations depending on which section we're on. But take the story bit, for example. I think in that case, understanding that there are really only a few really common and somewhat universal ways of telling a story is a great way to begin creating your own story. And those stories, you know, they come to us from Greek mythology. There are lists of these things out there, but 
they're really about like you know man versus uh, monster or, or man versus time or man versus the element and really that kind of story those stories can be somewhat universal especially if you think about what's driving those stories it comes down to satisfying some basic needs like what is my core desire here so in, that's another way i think of understanding the what's in it for me so if you can understand in your story what is the desire i'm satisfying for my consumer for example some consumers are are looking for a place to belong that might be the core desire they're looking to satisfy um for some of the other ideas they're kind of research based and and we can share the webinar materials afterwards that have some links to a few of the other places we can find some of these resources. Great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, as Joe was saying, we will definitely share some additional resources that you can use as well as a number of you asked for even further examples. So we'll definitely make sure to include those when we do our outreach after the webinar. Uh, for right now, just because we've got a couple other things to touch on, we're going to move to wrap up and give you back a few minutes. Uh, so if you weren't able to get your question answered, if you all of a sudden have another question, if you have one that comes up later, feel free to submit it either via the webinar console now or to email it to either uh, our general at hello at adagetechnologies.com email or if you see on our slide we have Joe's contact information, feel free to reach out to Joe. Feel free to reach out to Joe on Twitter, as well as the number you see below that is our general adage mainline. So if you'd like to speak to one of our consultants, all of them are well-versed in what Joe talked about today, you can reach out via the phone number and we'll make sure to connect you with someone who is an expert in your particular area. Again, as you'd expect, all attendees will receive a copy of today's presentation via email. We'd also encourage everyone to give us your feedback on the presentation specifically feel free to include that in your feedback. And then thanks to EpiServer and our partners at Gardner and Forrester, when you leave the webinar, you'll be offered the chance to receive some special resources on UX, e-commerce, and mobile. And so anything you'd like, feel free to enter that in your survey. And before we conclude, I just want to point out that this is a bi-monthly webinar series. So if you like this webinar, if you joined us for the last one and like that one too, I'd encourage you to go ahead and register for our next webinar. The next one coming up is called Breaking Down Your Purchase Path, a step-by-step -step look at what sells and what doesn't. So we're going to get a little bit more concrete in our next webinar, have some of our UX and our project management team break down the various steps of a purchase path, looking at UX, looking at customer experience, and then help you develop some tools to really examine and test your own purchase path. So if that sounds interesting, if you like today's webinar, I encourage you to go to adagetechnologies.com slash purchase16 or just wait because we'll be emailing it to you as well and make sure to RSVP for that webinar. All right, well, with that said, thank you so much to Joe again, our presenter, and to all of you for attending, especially those who are attending a webinar again. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and look out for our emails with the slides and additional resources. Thank you. <laughs>